Today I'm gonna do the impossible. Something everyone said I couldn't do, but I, I'm going to do. Today I am going to defend Joseph Sugarman. If you don't remember who he is, he's Bojack Horseman's grandfather, Beatrice Horseman's father, and one of the most notorious characters in modern TV history. So naturally, because I like a challenge, I am going to do what I said I'm gonna do. Defend him. When I started researching for this video, I asked my subscribers why they didn't like Joseph, and their answers were very reasonable. He lobotomized his wife, Honey, and then threatened to lobotomize Beatrice. He didn't care about his family and abandoned his wife as she mourned the loss of their son, Cracker Jack. He yelled at his wife after she had a manic, grief-filled breakdown over their son's death. He was sexist and tried to marry Beatrice off to benefit his business. And this is a direct quote. If I recall correctly, he could be, and I may be wrong, a dick. But then I watched the show again. And again. And again. And again. And again. And again. And again. In total, I've seen the entirety of BoJack Horseman seven times, which means I have the unique superpower of objectivity. Because by the time you've seen the series at least five times, you lose every sentimental feeling you've ever had towards anything and become a husk of the person you once were. It's a sad gray world, but I do it for you. I love you. You're welcome. So with that curse, I've noticed that despite what everyone thinks, what I used to think, Joseph Sugarman isn't a villain. He's actually a thoughtful and caring horse father and husband. It's just hard to see when we future people live in a world far removed from what we once considered okay back then. So with that, I'm gonna try to convince you that he's not a cold-hearted bastard. He's actually a really decent guy by what I consider universal morality. He's just packaged in the soot of old-timey social conventions. But before we begin, hi, I'm Arianne. Alexis, and I did not misspell defense in the title. In Canada, where I'm from, defense is spelt with a C and not an S. So no need to come at me in the comments for spelling. Everything else is fair game. I mention this because every in defensive video I make, I always get like 20 comments chastising me for how I spell defense. I'm okay with people thinking I'm stupid for other reasons, but I refuse to look like I made a spelling mistake in the title. While we're on the subject, I also have other videos defending other Bojack Horseman characters and other characters from other shows. So check them out. Remember, I love you. All right, so let's go back to the thesis of this video and talk about what I mean by absolute universal morality. I know that what makes a person good is nuanced and subjective, especially since right and wrong shifts depending on your cultural and social groups. But behavior is still a trait, and evolutionarily speaking, traits can be selected for. Another disclaimer, I used to be an evolutionary biologist and believe that morality is both absolute and relative, meaning that I believe actions are subjective but are based on an objective, scientifically explainable moral core. This is the backbone of my argument. You may agree with me, you may not agree with me. This is where I'm coming from. Given how many similarities and moral actions exist across vastly different species and cultural groups, there is a possibility that evolution has a part to play in shaping our moral reasoning and action. These evolutionarily selected moral behaviors and traits are what I believe to be the absolute universal moral truths that all relative moral action is based on. So what are these universal moral truths? Well, according to some scientific theorists and philosophers, evolutionary moral actions are ones where an individual either suppresses their self-interest in favor of another individual, or equates their self-interest interests with that of others. This includes things like helping, sharing, working together, basically any kind of pro-social behavior. The degree to which an individual exhibits these behaviors varies from person to person or monkey to monkey or horse to horse, but most people do showcase some amount of these traits. So why do most of us have this thing inside us that makes us play nice with others? Well, many people in the field believe that these pro-social tendencies are a consequence of group selection, where individual moral behaviors are selected for the benefit of the collective. Professor Michael Tomasello from Duke University theorized selection for collaboration happened as early human societies started relying on others to collect food. The more you invest in the well-being of others, the more you gain. This eventually baked into us the idea that helping people is good. Support for the evolutionary basis of these traits can be seen in how babies are little helping machines, even when it doesn't benefit them. Human babies and toddlers will help people with tasks when they see them struggling, hold doors open, share food, comfort those in distress. The fact that babies show these kinds of behaviors at such a young age suggests that people have an innate drive to help. In the garbage, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> However, as those early human groups became more interdependent, they started to close themselves off, resulting in competition between other groups for resources. This led to these little communities becoming even more interreliant. The stronger the group, the better they can stand up against enemies. And what do teams do if they want to be better than others? They organize. And organize they did. From there, distinct roles formed within these communities, each with their own jobs and place in society. It was vital to conform to your role in the group and display your membership to maintain a united front against threats or competitors. Members of the group started shaming individuals who didn't conform to their place in society to keep them in check. Think High School Musical and how they use singing to make people stop baking. Like that. 
So to recap, group selection towards pro-social behavior so that everybody in the group could eat morphed into making people fill distinct roles in society so that the group could survive competition from other groups. It's funny because early childhood development research also supports the evolutionary basis of conforming to societal standards. Children as young as three can be seen chastising people who don't follow social or established rules. For example, if you had a brick, told a kid it was a phone, and then started using it as a pencil, the kid would get pissed and try to stop you from using it incorrectly because a phone isn't a pencil, you monster. Okay, so now that we've established the basis of my universal morality argument, let's go back to Joseph Sugarman and look at how the things that people say they hate him for are actually rooted in evolutionary established pro-social behaviors, but done through the need to conform to 1940s norms and beliefs. And now we get to the lobotomy. Joseph lobotomizing his wife, Honey, is hands down the number one reason audiences hate Joseph. They say, how could he do that to someone he loves? Why would he punish her for grieving the death of their son? What a dick. That's all pretty easy to say as a person living in the year. <laughs> but let's all take a trip to the mid 20th century when people didn't know lobotomies were bad. What? That's crazy. Invasive brain tinkering of some kind has been around since the Mayan times, but the infamous transorbital lobotomy or ice pick lobotomy was developed in 1937 by a guy named Walter Freeman. He would do up to 25 lobotomies in a single day. He eventually developed a way to do two at once, one with each hand at the same time. During a transorbital lobotomy, the frontal lobe and the thalamus are severed by hammering essentially an ice pick through a very thin membrane in the patient's eye socket. Fun fact, the ice pick lobotomy was based on the work of a Portuguese doctor whose technique of drilling a hole in people's heads and pouring acid in won him a Nobel Prize. He was like Dahmer, but with respect. So there you go. Share that at your next birthday party. Freeman, the ice pick guy, would travel across the US and perform the procedure on people in his truck, which he may or may not have called the lobotomobile. Which, while being a great name, is a missed opportunity. He could have called it the lobotomy or vehicular manslaughter. Idiot. Now, it's not like lobotomies were some kind of torture tactic intended to fuck people up. They thought it was a miracle cure for anything that mentally ailed you. Depressed? Anxious? On your period? Why not have someone touch your brain? They would look super scary and threatening in the before pictures, but then like chill and approachable in the afters. A lobotomy seemed like a pretty legit option, but turns out the reason people looked so mellow in the after pictures was that they were basically vegetables. Lobotomies don't cure mental health problems. They just make people with mental health problems easier to deal with. Lobotomies were eventually banned in the US in 1967 when medicine advanced past the point of shoving prison tools in people's eyes. But in the time it was allowed, over 40,000 people were lobotomized, with the most notable being 23-year-old Rosemary Kennedy, or President JFK's sister, who became severely brain damaged because of the procedure and was hidden in a nursing home for the rest of her life. This isn't really related to the video, but it is another fun birthday party fact. This is the world Joseph was coming from when he decided to have Honey lobotomized after she had a manic breakdown following their son's death. It was supposed to help her be okay and go back to living a normal life. Help that Honey asked for. I know it sounds horrible. Don't yell at me. As Joseph screams at Honey for going hysterical and almost killing Beatrice, Honey begs Joseph to make her not feel that way anymore. I don't know how to be better, Joseph. Please fix me. She wanted to not be depressed and they turned to a popular solution that they both probably thought was viable. He didn't want to take away her autonomy or make her a brainless compliant zombie. The show establishes early in meeting Joseph and Honey that he liked how strong and sassy she was. As Joseph said after the procedure, I swear, if I'd known this is how you'd behave once we severed the connections to your prefrontal cortex, I'd hardly have bothered. He didn't know. It's the equivalent of blaming pregnant mothers for taking thalidomide for morning sickness, not realizing it resulted in birth defects, which is another thing that happened. But more recently, if you were bold, you can even say that Joseph was a victim of the lobotomy. And I am bold, so I am saying that. Now, he wasn't a victim to the same degree as Honey, but still, he lost his wife and basically replaced her with a shadowy figure floating around the house from reminding him of that loss. Which takes us to the next point people like to make for why they don't like Joseph. He didn't care about his family, which is exemplified by how he abandons Honey and Beatrice after Cracker Jack's death and yells at Honey for her breakdown instead of comforting her. I will be tackling this point in two parts before and after the breakdown. Before the breakdown, she can't deal with the pain. Joseph seems calm, but uncomfortable as he states, As a modern American man, I am woefully unprepared to manage a woman's emotions. 
I was never taught and I will not learn. Then he slinks out the door. He's ditching her so that he doesn't have to deal with her. One of my subscribers described this moment as, there was so much he could have done for Honey and Beatrice and instead he chose to remain ignorant and cruel. Now you could say he didn't want to learn how to deal with Honey's emotions and call it a day. But the other side of this is that he also never learned how to deal with his own emotions. As I'm sure we're all aware, the world of the early to mid 20th century was not the most emotionally intelligent. Being too emotional or expressive was frowned upon or seen as uncomfortable thus the rampant lobotomies. Joseph wasn't just not taught how to handle emotions, he was also taught they weren't proper. So while it looks like he's fine while Honey was going through hell, he probably also wasn't doing so amazingly. I mean, he also just lost his son. But instead of letting his feelings out, he shoved them down. And while he looked like he didn't care about Honey in this specific moment that we're talking about, he did take her to the cottage in the middle of the winter after Cracker Jack died so she could look for his blanket. That sure feels like something you would do if you cared about someone. This takes us to after Honey's breakdown where she gets drunk and drove Beatrice and herself into a tree. Instead of acknowledging her pain and his role in it, he yells at her and throws things. But let's look at this moment through the lens of what we just talked about. Joseph, who was raised to be cool and cordial and not deal with his emotions, has been holding it together through his son's death as he also supports his understandably emotional wife. But then, when he leaves his wife alone for the first time with his daughter, she flies off the handle and almost kills their remaining child. The scene where he blows up at Honey looks like he's being insensitive because we're following Honey through this episode. But if you watch it again, and again, and again, and again, it reads more like a man who's going batshit on a person who almost just murdered his young daughter. A man who's most likely barely holding it together, nearly lost the rest of his family that night. What were you thinking? Hoofing around the dance floor like a motorized freckle. Did you snap your cap? You mustn't despise me, darling, please. And that's before even mentioning poor Beatrice. You aiming to get her killed as well? She's all we got. Now he shouldn't have left Beatrice when honey when she was so not okay. But going back to the conventions of the time, the woman's role was to take care of the home and the children while the men provided. And as we discussed, we were bred to conform to societal standards as a way of uniting the group and surviving. An instinct that would have been especially strong back then given the war and the constant propaganda they would have been consuming. In the same vein, even though Joseph prescribes the idea of defined gender roles, after the lobotomy when Honey couldn't take care of Beatrice anymore, Joseph appeared to step into his wife's role. A lot of people like to cite how Joseph callously threw Beatrice's doll in a fire when she got sick as a reason for why he's a horrible father and doesn't care about his family. But let's break down this scenario too. Scarlet fever was a common yet fatal condition back in those days. One of the ways they believed you could reduce the spread and severity of the disease was to dispose of any items an infected person may have come in contact with. which is what they did with Beatrice's stuff, including the things she interacted with most, her doll. Could he have been a little more tactful in how he took it from her? Sure. But would Beatrice, a small child, willingly give him her baby to throw in a fire? Where's my baby? Hell no. So he did what he needed to do. He yoinked, causing Beatrice to have a panic attack. An actual uncaring and angry person who wasn't in touch with their feelings would have punished her for crying and panicking. But he didn't. He calmly attempted to talk her down by walking her through what was happening. But father, tell them not to burn my things. But darling, they have to. Your sickness has infected everything. It all must be destroyed for your own good. But not my baby. Yes, especially your baby. <gasps> See, doesn't that feel better? If you hear the scene described in a vacuum, it sounds like a slightly out of touch parent trying to help their child process a big feeling. But since we, the viewers, are observing it through Beatrice, who's filtering the memory through the lens of trauma and Alzheimer's, we see him as a monster. The same twisting happens when he tells her, Come on now, be strong. You can't let your womanly emotions consume you. You don't want to end up like your mother now, do you? This is one of the most misunderstood lines in the show and the second reason people hate Joseph. Because it kind of sounds like he's threatening to lobotomize Beatrice if she keeps crying. But remember that we're also hearing him say this as he walks through fire like the literal devil in front of a silhouette of her lobotomized mother. We're looking at him through Beatrice's childhood fear and trauma when she didn't fully understand what was happening. All she knew is that her mother was upset and her dad did something to change her. That's how this scene is presented. But let's look at the straight facts. As we said, Joseph clearly Really regretted having Honey lobotomized and wanted her back. He also believed Honey let her emotions control her to the point that she became a danger to herself and her child. So when he said, You don't want to end up like your mother now, do you? He probably wasn't threatening to lobotomize her. He was probably just warning her about what he thinks happens when you let your emotions consume you. The writers were obviously trying to pack the sentence with two interpretations, one from the perspective of a child and one from the perspective of an adult. It's just a way of communicating how innocuous comments parents make can have unintentional impacts on their children. 
children. Next on the docket for why people hate Joseph is that he was sexist, seen in both the lobotomy, which we've already talked about, and his relationship with Beatrice as an adult. More specifically by saying he sent her to college to get an MRS degree and not a smart mouth when she talks back to him about how rich and out of touch he is, forces her to date Corbin Creamerman for the benefit of his sugar business, and gets angry at her for ditching her date with Corbin at her debutante ball. Let's first discuss him getting upset at her for talking back at him. You know, I sent you to Barnard to get your MRS from a fine upstanding Columbia man, but instead of a bachelor, you returned home with a bachelor's degree and a mouthful of sass. What a waste. Yes, Beatrice has a smart mouth, but you know who else had a smart mouth? Her mom, Honey. From the little we get to see of Honey before Cracker Jack died, we know that she's competent, strong, free-spirited. She pushes back against Joseph and says what she wants to say. And in the brief time we get to see Joseph before Cracker Jack's death, he seems to like how free she is. Honey Sugarman, how did such a sweet face end up with such a smart mouth? We're observing them in a cutesy low stakes moment, but the thought stands. So why would Joseph, a man who seems to enjoy a free spirit, get shitty about Beatrice's smart mouth? Well, when they're both just getting ready for a party and chatting about a guy he's setting her up with, she puts him on blast saying everything he thinks is now irrelevant. You're a reminder of the disparity of wealth in this country. She's not wrong, but to him, he thinks he's doing right by his daughter, and now she's being unnecessarily hostile. Wouldn't you also get a little defensive if your kid randomly called you out in the middle of what you believe to be a normal conversation right before you go to a party that you're throwing for them? Plus, I mean, he is a rich male horse from a time when people would have given him a lot of leeway. Of course he's gonna push back. It takes more than a couple of angry conversations to get someone who's stuck in their way to change. And now to address the whole Joseph trying to marry off Beatrice to someone and having her go to college to get an MRS degree. I sent you to Barnard to get your MRS from a fine upstanding Columbia man. And by the way, MRS stands for Mrs. A Mrs. degree. It was what they used to call it when you would go to college to get a husband. There was a song when I went to college at Smith College, which they don't sing anymore, I know, that had a verse that went something like this. But when a man wants a kiss kid, he doesn't want a quiz kid. Oh, you can't get a man with your brains. Remember that thing I said before where people believe that universal pro-social morality evolved alongside a need to conform to group conventions and assigned roles as a way of survival? Well, back when Joseph was growing up, there was a much stronger division of labor between men and women that they believed was crucial for the maintenance of society. Men were responsible for providing for the family, and women were responsible for caring for the family and being good companions for their husbands, which meant going to school and knowing how to speak and think and hold a conversation. So since women weren't even allowed to open bank accounts until the 1960s, the main way they could live a decent life was to marry a man who would support them. And of course the overall goal was to find a husband, get married, have children, and live with a white picket fence. Joseph wanting Beatrice to get married was him trying to enforce a social norm he believed she needed to follow to have a good life. He wanted her to be taken care of, so he tried setting her up with someone from a wealthy family who would take care of her and would also bolster their own business. Father, do you aim to marry me off to Corbin Creamerman merely because it would be good for business? Well, I suppose I do have a few ideas of how a Sugarman Creamerman alliance might be advantageous. I am not interested in Corbin Creamerman. I don't give a damn where you're interested lie. Oh. After the disappearing act you pulled at your own party, you're lucky I don't fill a jar with jellied beans and marry you off to the man who can closest estimate the amount. Heavens! When they're arguing, it seems like he's pushing her towards some dude for his own benefit, but in getting to know Corbin, we learn that he's a nice, intelligent, upstanding guy that she got along with, and if she didn't get pregnant, probably would have married. You know, Corbin... It occurs to me that perhaps you and I aren't so- <laughs> And it makes sense that Joseph would have gotten angry at her for walking out of her party and Corbin to be with some random who just crashed her very expensive ball. I know the audience gets to see the chemistry between Beatrice and Butterscotch, but if you look at it from Joseph's perspective, it was a dick move from his 21-year-old daughter who just got back from university who thinks she's better than him. Forget that this is a defense of Joseph, it's just rude. Everyone loves to focus on Joseph's negatives, but the show gives us a lot of hints that he's not actually a bad guy. Those hints just get hidden when we see him through Beatrice in our 21st century moral conventions. In the episode Time's Arrow when Beatrice is a child after her mother's lobotomy, Joseph is a present parent who is there for his child and is positively involved in her life. He gave her encouragement in dealing with bullies. When the other kids called her fat, we learned that he comforted her and made her feel better by telling her that she was still growing. Yeah, and also you're fat. Oh. 
<laughs> I'm not fat. Father says I'm just growing. Which is the most positive thing you can say to a little girl in the 1940s. And when Beatrice got pregnant and left to marry a man who had nothing, Joseph supported her and gave her stupid, shitty husband a job so that she could still have the life he wanted for her. You may say that all of this is not an excuse for how badly he traumatized her. But you also have to remember that the main message of the show is that while generation trauma is suffocating, you have control over your own life and the decisions you make. Beatrice just chose to shape her life based on the worst parts of her childhood, not the positive examples she was given. Philosopher St. Thomas Aquinas said, Sometimes we seek what we think is good, but we are wrong because we are ignorant. Throughout history, we thought lobotomies were a solid medical treatment, cigarettes wouldn't kill us, and women are only equipped to maintain the home. We only know what we know and can only make decisions based on the information available to us at the time. But that's the beauty of time. We may be ignorant, but we can learn. We can't blame people for trying to do what's right, but doing it in a way that doesn't meet the standards of the culture you live in. Because one day that's gonna be you, and no one wants to be hated for trying to do the best they could. And that was my in defense of Joseph Sugarman. Everyone said I couldn't do it, but I think I did it pretty successfully. I don't know. Let me know in the comments. I would just like to remind you that I have other in defense of videos looking at other Bojack Horseman characters slash characters from other TV shows. Highly recommend you check those out now. And uh, if you have another character from Bojack or preferably another show that you would like me to defend because I, I don't want to watch Bojack again. Or like if you have suggestions for other videos that you want me to make that aren't in defense of, let me know. I'm open to anything. And with that, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Thank you.